you can't solve the problem. You will always need to put in some initial condition and then you can ask, well, why this initial condition? Why are we here? What happened to let us be left over? Uh, our, our amount of matter. And that's what we really don't understand. How would we make a theory of the initial condition? A theory of all the parameters in the standard model that come in to phenomena like the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Welcome to uh, the anti-universe. From Star Trek to Dan Brown novels, Doctor Who to Marvel comics, antimatter has fascinated since it was proposed by Dirac in the 1920s and confirmed with the discovery of the positron just a few de years later. Heisenberg, the father of uh, modern physics, referred to its discovery as, quote, the biggest jumps of all the big jumps in physics. But there's a fundamental problem. The theory predicts the disappearance of the universe within moments of its inception as matter and antimatter destroy each other in a huge cataclysm. Yet here we are, 14 billion years later, and we seem to have good evidence our universe exists, and yet scientists still uphold the antimatter theory. Is it time to give up the idea that for every particle there's an antiparticle? Or would this be a threat to particle physics itself? Is it right to overlook fundamental flaws in a theory in favour of neatness and simplicity and buzzwords? Or nearly a century on from its inception, should we stand by the theory confident? that a solution will be found. Well, with me to uh, discuss this uh, fascinating topic, we have a remarkable panel to tackle this deep puzzle. Sabina Hossenfelder is an author and physicist who researches the foundation of physics. Sabina is not afraid to be controversial. Her books include Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, and talks such as What's Wrong with Physics. Tara Shears is a particle physicist and one of the leading British scientists at CERN. Tara has also collaborated with artists and novelists to explore concepts involved, including an exhibition at the Royal Society titled Antimatter Matters. No doubt we'll be hearing from her why she thinks so today. And Lee Smolin is one of the world's leading theoretical physicists. He's been a critic of string theory, notably in his book, The Trouble with Physics, and has instead devised his own means of unifying quantum mechanics and relativity, loop quantum gravity, along with others. Lee is also a professor of philosophy and has written a number of books in this field, arguing there's only one universe and that time is real. So I'm gonna give each of our speakers just three minutes to set out their initial response to the question, is it time to give up on our theory of antimatter? And then we'll proceed to the debate. So, Sabina. Well, so to answer the question, is it time to give up on our theory of antimatter? I think the answer is no. Um, and to explain why, let me pick up something that you said in the introduction that um, the current theory predicts that our universe should have disappeared within the blink of an eye or something like this. That's just not correct. The theory does not predict that. And to see why, um, I have to briefly explain how all our current theories work in the foundations of physics. Um, you, have, uh, you have something that's called the initial condition. That's a summary of all the information about the system that you're trying to describe. So in, in this case, it would be all the particles in the universe and the universe itself. And then we have something that's called an evolution equation, which acts on that initial state and tells you what happens at all other moments in time. And uh, the theories that we currently use, they all work the same way. Um, so you need this initial condition to make any prediction with the theory, but the theory cannot itself predict the initial condition. And uh, when we say that the universe should have been, uh, you know, self-destroyed within a blink of an eye, um, 
What this means is that we have made an assumption about a particular initial condition. In that case, it's that there are exactly equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and those should have destroyed. But it's very easy to solve the problem by just choosing uh, an initial condition that agrees with what we observe presently. And that's actually what people also do when they work with these theories. Um, so the actual problem comes down to saying there are certain types of initial conditions which we do not like, and I don't think that this is a serious problem. Thank you, Sabina. Uh, Tara. So I'm, I'm going to come at this from an experimentalist point of view, and, and to me to answer this question, it's first of all necessary to separate out what we mean by a theory of antimatter and just what that's going to describe before we can justifiably say whether it's time to throw it away or not. And I'm very much with Sabine on this one. So to me, I would say that theory of antimatter, the working theory of antimatter that we use is the one that's embedded in our theory of particle physics, this, um, the standard model. And I say that simply because it's made some predictions, the existence of antimatter, which have then been proven by experiment. So we have a cross check. So I am coming at this at a slightly different um, point of view. So that's that's what I would take as our, as our theory of antimatter. I mean, there are other theories out there, but they do not yet have experimental verification. So we don't really know if they're right or not. So I'm going to stick with the standard model. And we'll come back to that later in, in the debate as to whether that's a good idea or not. Um, so that, that's the theory of antimatter. Is it is it time to throw it away? Well, no, absolutely not. Because to be honest, we haven't finished doing it yet. It's not complete. Um, Sabine made reference to the initial conditions at the start of the universe. So I'd phrase this as an assumption that at the Big Bang, we assumed there were equal, apart, equal parts of matter and antimatter in the universe. We assume this, it's fair to say. It's a, um, I, I'd phrase it as it's an argument phrased on conservation laws and, and symmetry, but it is an assumption and it's worth remembering that, but it, it's the working assumption that we use. We know that at that very early time in the universe, when it was made of particles and their antimatter versions, these particles and antiparticles did meet and annihilate in the, in the sense of the description that you gave, but on that very small scale. We know after these annihilations, more matter and antimatter was produced, but we know this process didn't carry on for very long. And less than a second after the Big Bang, something had happened to tip the balance in favor of matter in the way we see it in the universe today, when antimatter is very rare. And why that happened, the exact mechanism that governed why that happened, the explanation, that's we don't have at the moment. And that's what I think is necessary for us to conquer in our theory of antimatter before we can make any decisions about what we do with it. So there's a long, long way to go um, for me. I, I'd argue that we don't have a theory <laughs> that we know that really fully explains everything yet, and we need it before we can give it up. Thank you, Tara. And Lee. I'd like to go a little bit further and contemplate what a theory that explains the amount of matter versus antimatter that we see in the initial conditions. Because we're, we're in, as Sabina emphasized, a situation where our theory is incomplete in that knowing the laws of motion is only part of the physics and the other part that you need to explain why our universe is the way it is, is as Sabine said, the initial conditions. So how would we make a theory of the initial condition? And related to that, how would we make a theory of all the parameters in the standard model that come in to phenomenon like the asymmetry between matter and antimatter? And I'll quote the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce in saying that the only way we can explain initial conditions or the laws themselves is if they're the result of some mechanism of evolution. If they change and there's some dynamical explanation for why that's a good thing for the universe to have a little bit more matter than antimatter. And moreover, Charles Sanders first said, and I think this is important to emphasize, until we explain where the initial conditions come from or where the parameters and laws come from, we haven't explained anything. 
as he said, the laws themselves, just to state the laws, is not to explain. Is not to explain. The laws themselves require explanation. Let me just rest on the point that there needs to be not just some nebulous new idea, but I would follow Charles Sanders first and say that it needs to be an idea about how the laws change and evolve leading to the initial conditions at the beginning of our universe. Thank you. Thank you. So I think probably fair to say that you all want to maintain the antimatter theory, but have slightly different approaches to how you might go about it. Just before we look at the detail of the debate there, perhaps it might be helpful just to clarify exactly what we understand by antimatter and indeed why some people would think that there might be a problem with it. So Tara, you were outlining for us the, the, uh, uh, the background to this. Is it right to say that antimatter, the antimatter theory predicts that for every particle and potentially all combinations of particles, there is an antiparticle or groups of antiparticles. It's, it's, it's correct to say that in, in particle physics, which is the study of the smallest constituents of the universe, the fundamental particles, it, it's correct to say that we've identified a handful of different types of these fundamental particles that are responsible for building up together, giving matter, conveying the action of forces and so on. Each type of fundamental particle potentially has an antimatter counterpart. When you say potentially has, doesn't the antimatter theory predict that for every particle there is an antimatter particle? Well, just to complicate matters, some particles can be their own antimatter version. In that sense, um, I say that potentially particles can have antimatter counterparts. Of course, they all do. It's just that in some cases, um, they are the same thing. Yeah. So in terms of why some people see there being a fundamental problem with the antimatter theory, it's that when a particle, an antiparticle, meet, uh, they, as it were, evaporate in a uh, sort of cataclysm of uh, uh, matter d destruction, and you're just left with energy. I is that correct? But actually, we're fine with that. <laughs> that's, um, we, that that's, a, that's the sort of thing we're, we're happy with happening. And what happens after that is that the energy that is produced can then go on into making new particles and antimatter particles if there's enough of it. So uh, according to the, the solutions to the Dirac equation, which is where all of this I I originated, there are, there are two solutions, the, the, the uh, matter solution and the antimatter solution. And the antimatter solution means that for every matter particle, there's an antimatter particle against it. And the problem potentially with that is that when these two meet, uh, they, the mass is lost and you, you get energy. And if that was the case, if it was the case that the universe started with equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and that was the initial proposal, that it was equal amounts because you've got these two solutions, so you would think that there would be equal amounts, the whole thing would have gone up in smoke. Is that, is that the problem? I suppose in a nutshell, that is the problem. So the issue for us is why are we here after that happened? You know, what, what happened to let us be left over? At, our amount of matter. And that's what we really don't understand, what the mechanism is that allowed that and why that should be. What it is that should make antimatter just that little bit different to normal matter to allow this amount of matter in the universe to survive. In practice, we find very, very little antimatter in the universe, don't we? There's, a, there's only a small amount of antimatter, uh, the vast majority of that is matter. And where's all of the antimatter gone if, it, if, if there was the same amount beforehand? Indeed, indeed. So it's all part of the same problem. Um, antimatter does exist. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a, a fallacy or a fiction. You, it's produced in radioactive decay, but not very much. There's not very much of it at all. So it hasn't really got away from the main question of why, if you start off with half-half, if very quickly, half of it seems to disappear, more or less. That, that's, that's the issue um, which really affects our understanding of antimatter. That's the big hole, really, I'd say, in particle physics. Then, in terms of the question that we're therefore facing, um, do we think that we've held this antimatter uh, theory from, from uh, when Dirac proposed it, uh, roughly 100 years ago, not quite, and, um, 
uh, were we right to overlook these fundamental flaws uh, in favor of just, well, we, we like the look of it, it's quite a nice looking theory, and it does have some positive uh, uh, predictions which work. Were, were we right to do that? Or should we be you know, exploring the, the fu fundamental problems a bit more directly? I'd say at the start that you, um, there, there's, there's quite a few things in this question. Um, so first of all, the, the issue with antimatter and our understanding of it doesn't really per se have anything to do with Dirac's prediction. That, that's fine. It made a prediction. There was experimental evidence that matched against it and, and that worked. We don't have a problem with, with Dirac's equation. Uh, there are flaws in our understanding though, because we quite clearly don't um, understand how the universe evolved. That is a pretty fundamental flaw in our understanding of the universe and matter. But to decompose it and break it down, it doesn't mean that just because you know there's an element of the universe that you do not understand, it doesn't make your whole theory wrong. You know that your theory has shortcomings, is not complete, and ultimately is not the answer. But it might be effective. It, it might work where in, in the region where you have experimental evidence and where you're looking. So you shouldn't throw it out from that point of view if it can still tell you something. I mean, obviously, if it doesn't, then there's no point at all in having it. Now, you might also be asking about why should you, one should be guided by this notion of simplicity that's inherent in Dirac's prediction, which makes it such a nice prediction. Um, Antimatter comes out of nowhere, really, really nowhere, just, it, just out of this um, journey for Dirac to use the theories of the time, special relativity and quantum theory, to, to provide the, the best description of an electron in any circumstance. Mm -hmm. And out of it, you get this idea of antimatter. It's wonderful. There's definitely a history in the subject that if you can find a simpler explanation, one that cuts out complication, it's generally taken to be the correct one and sort of run with and, and until you find something wrong with it. And I don't know, to be honest, whether that's something in our natures that attracts us to the subject that makes us look more kindly on explanations like that, or, or whether it is genuinely an underlying feature of the universe that the simpler, deeper explanations work better. Now, I said I'm not really answering this theme. I'm just bringing up questions that I hope everybody else is going to explore. So, so Sabina, do, do you think uh, we, should, uh, we should be driven by this simplicity and uh, overlook some of the consequences of that? Well, before I answer this question, uh, I want to clarify one thing that uh, might confuse some people. Uh, you said something to the extent that if you have matter and antimatter, they annihilate to pure energy or something like that. There, there isn't really any such thing as pure energy. No. This energy always has to be carried by something. So if they annihilate, they just create another particle. <laughs> it's just that we see that the universe, usually it's some kind of photon. Um, that the universe is not only, it does not only contain photons. Okay, so now to answer uh, your question, is there some problem, should we go with simplicity uh, and so on? I, um, I, I want to come back to what I said in the very beginning. You were starting talking about uh, Dirac's equation and that for every particle you have a partner particle, that's an, an antiparticle, uh, just that as, as Tara points out correctly, some particles can be their, their own antiparticles. Um, that does not tell you anything about the amount of that matter that is in the universe. Um, so Dirac's theory d doesn't say anything about it, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, what some people think is wrong is that they do not like um, that this initial condition must have been so that there was a tiny little amount more of um, matter than antimatter, because otherwise, as we already um, discussed, uh, they would just have um, left behind a lot of photons, which is not what we observe. Are you suggesting that we should explore I mean, you were saying it just a little bit more. It, it, that's presumably because you're thinking, well, if we have just a little bit more matter than antimatter, the uh, that will that will be the bit that's left over because the remaining uh, matter and antimatter will be turned into photons, and uh, and the, the matter will be destroyed. So we'll just be left with the matter bit. So we don't have to have the same sort of huge uh, split in favour of matter at the outset. Is that what you're arguing? 
Well, I, I think I'm just referring to the number. I think Tara must know this, right? I mean, there are some estimates from cosmology how exactly how much more matter you must have had in the beginning over antimatter. And it's a tiny amount, which is like, I don't know, 10 to the minus 11 or something. So the, the question is really um, in this, I, I dare to say, beautiful assumption of symmetry and, and charge conservation or what have you, uh, which we don't know is correct. The assumption is the ratio was exactly 1.0000000. OK, and uh, that does not agree with observation. Um, instead, the ratio was more like something like 1.0000001. Okay, and I'm saying where the, one of these numbers is exactly as simple as the other number. Okay, so the people who think that there's something simpler about the last digit being a zero uh, than it being a one uh, don't understand this requirement of simplicity. And uh, without that, it comes down to an argument from beauty. And I don't think that's uh, a scientific criterion, which is why I don't think it's a serious problem. So, Lee, b beauty is not a serious scientific uh concern. Would you agree with that? I don't, that's, uh, that's a debate that I've been having on different terms with Sabine for a long time. But let, can I correct some of the discussion here and be a little bit more specific? There are two theorems that are essential to particle physics that are at stake here. And when you say something like there's a flaw and is, should we be responding to the flaw? This is what you're really referring to. So let's put them on the table. There is a symmetry called CPT, which means take antiparticles, reverse the direction of time and look in the mirror. And CPT is a theorem in a certain class of theories called quantum field theories that respect both the axioms of Einstein's theory of special relativity and quantum mechanics. If you believe those two theories are ultimately correct, then you believe that doing those three things must be like doing nothing. And that's relevant because of the role of C to turn particles into antiparticles. But to turn that into a prediction that during the, the growth of the universe, there needs there would be an equal number produced, you need another assumption, as was demonstrated by Sakharov, who was one of the great Soviet theoretical physicists and cosmologists. And that's the assumption that the universe, as it expands, is already is always in thermal equilibrium. So that there's a balance equation as in chemistry. So the rate of production of particles is the same as the rate of production of antiparticles. And that's not necessarily true. And it's not difficult for the cosmologists to hypothesize and study scenarios in which during the expansion of the universe, it was out of equilibrium. And that's all you need. You don't need to overthrow the foundations. I'm, I'm the guy who loves to overthrow the foundations. It's completely conventional to solve the problem by having the universe expand so rapidly in the early stages that it goes out of equilibrium for a little while. And then you do produce more baryons than antibaryons. And there's a whole subject in which people study how that might happen and discuss all the ins and outs of different hypotheses about it. So there's no crisis here. There's nothing, there's no flaw. I wish that, I love to talk about flaws and crises, but that's not the case we're dealing with. So do I understand you in saying that, well, yes, there are things that uh, we need to come up with explanations for, but we can modify the theory. We don't have to have some sort of radical transformation. Is, is, that, is that what you're, you're saying? Then? It's not a modification. The universe expands, and if it expands fast enough, it goes out of thermal equilibrium. Well, and Sackler showed that's all that we need. But, but some people may, might say, well, that's just an ad hoc way of trying to explain why we get the outcome that we do. And maybe it's a satisfactory way of explaining that. Uh, but there are alternative ways of, uh, of coming to that conclusion. 
And it's not currently in the theory, is it? it, it it's, a, it's a postulate. We're looking for the best explanation. That's what science does. It looks for the provisional best explanation. And this is certainly an open problem. It's not tied down, but neither is it a fundamental mystery like the measurement problem in quantum mechanics or quantum gravity or several, several of the others. Um, it, it, one could go that way. For example, you could say um, maybe special relativity isn't really exactly true when you get to really, really, really short distances. That's an area that Sabine and I have tangled in, is the world that that creates. And maybe that would undermine the CPT theorem. And maybe that would give another avenue to make an asymmetry between baryons and antibaryons. There are certainly people who have written and talked a lot about CPT violations in, in quantum gravity, but I'm not aware that they've said a terrible lot about uh, what happened in the early universe. The problem is that there are so many other things that come in there. So maybe this is something that Tara can tell us about. Uh, you know, there's, there's very little that we can directly see about the early universe. So a lot of this comes down to speculation. Um, but we have particle colliders, right? Uh, so uh, what can we learn from that? Well, particle colliders can only take us so far. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, if, we, if we have an explanation, we know it's an explanation. We need experimental evidence to confront it with to make sure it matches. It's, um, I mean, it's really helpful to have ideas and it's really helpful to have theoretical guidance. But at the end of the day, we, we need both of these things knitted together to, to have a fulfilled explanation. And the whole idea and principle of our experiments at particle colliders is, is to recreate the very high energies of, of the universe when it was at those very early points. Something like 10 to the power of minus to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. And that's the sort of energy scale that I'm, I'm talking about. And we can study matter at that point, and we can study antimatter at that point, and we can look for differences in their behavior. Uh, and it's coming at this problem really from the bottom and taking a bottom up approach to see what are those differences? Can we measure a difference? What might they mean? We need help interpreting this. And that's the stage at we where we are um, in the experimental field. So Lee has the, the um, the, the approach that this, this is unsolved, but it's not a, a you know, really fundamental problem, it, but it will be solved. I'm perhaps at, at the other end wondering how I can provide evidence to confront a, a theory at the very small levels that might um, show it's right or not. So for, for me, there's still a bit of a gulf there. Isn't it the case that, uh, so uh, sorry, these, these energies that you were just talking about that we can produce uh, at uh, big colliders and so on are still way, way, way below um, the energy scales where the particles would actually have been produced, yeah. right? Like the, the space that Lee was talking about is just way out of experimental uh, test, isn't it? That's, that's, that's absolutely right. So there's 10 to the minus 12 seconds I was talking about. I mean, that is the experimental limit. Um, so how far we can go. Cosmology is, is, is perhaps the, the, the theory that takes over at that point to go back to the very earliest times. But there isn't, there's not direct experimental tests in the sense that we can link to particle physics yet because we simply don't have the technology or the ability to know how we can test it and, and create an environment that would be representative. I wonder whether at that point we could you know, move on from this initial conversation about the nature of the problem to the question of whether the antimatter puzzle is going to be solved by experiment. And that's very much related to what you were, you were talking about there, Tara. Do, do you think experiment is going to be the solution to this? Uh -huh. Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, and, and I say yes and no simply because you need experiment and you need theory. I mean, they're both parts of the scientific method that get you to the answer. You, you, need, you need to have experiments to give you the evidence to confront theory and hypotheses with to see if they're correct. But you also need theory to, to take experimental evidence and give context to it and interpret it. You can't, you can't get knowledge um, just by having one of them. You need the other as well. So is it going to be solved by experiment? Well, yes, but it's also going to be solved by theory as well, by both of them together. Lee, do you, do you think that theory has to lead here? And is there a danger that 
theory just sort of spins free, that it's not constrained enough by empirical data, especially if you know, our, uh, our kit used to, uh, to do the experiments just can't deliver the energy levels uh, to, uh, to test the theory. Thank you. There is a danger of theory getting too extravagant and getting out of the reach of experimental check. Do, do you think that uh, the solution is going to be found with uh, colliders and begin, b building ever, b ever bigger ones in, in, in search of experimental data? No, definitely not. I mean, to begin with, I, I was trying to explain that I don't think there is a problem, uh, right? Uh, so now I can't possibly say that we need a colliders to, <laughs> to solve the problem. So um, no, I mean, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, we don't need to build a bigger collider um, to figure out how that works. But maybe let me come back to something that uh, Lee said in the beginning, because uh, I think that's a that's a very interesting point. Since you were asking about what what can theory uh, theory do for for us, um, so as I said, the the kind of theory that we currently use, like the standard model and also general relativity, um, they generally have a problem with certain types of questions uh, when it comes to an initial value, like the, the ratio of matter to antimatter, uh, but also other things like, for example, in cosmology, people are discussing the question, why is the curvature of our universe what it is? And that also goes back to a question of, a, of an initial condition. And, and there are lots of other um, issues like that. Um, which you just cannot solve within the framework of the theories that we currently use. You, you need an entirely different type of theory. And uh, Lee has uh, worked on one of these, which um, I think, what do you call it? Cosmological natural selection. Um, the way I like to think about it is, is it asks the question, are there certain universes that are in a, in a very specific quantifiable way better than others? And that kind of theory is an example of a theory that could actually answer a question like this. Like, are there certain ratios of matter that are in a very specific way better than others? And uh, maybe there are other, you know, um, theories that can do that kind of thing, but it definitely requires a new type of theory. But as I understand it, Sabina, I, I think you, uh, you're arguing that we can solve this problem by by playing with the initial conditions. And, and, uh, but how are you going to test this? Um, uh, you might have alternative theoretical uh, solutions, and Lee's been giving us uh, a bit of a guidance to his one. But aren't you going to have to look at the experimental results in order to be able to determine which theory to adopt? Well, yes, of course. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, we have well, data, we have theories, we ask which is the best theory to fit the data, and right now that's the standard model. And okay. it, it, there's no contradiction with the data exactly because you can choose the initial condition well, as you want. There's, <laughs> there's, no, there's no contradiction with the, with the theory so long as you choose the initial conditions to have that outcome. And then we have to just check, well, well is, is it plausible that that would be, uh, or, or is that a... a, a well, you, you can't. There's th this question question, is it plausible, you cannot answer within the framework of that theory. The initial condition is an assumption that you have to enter into the theory. You're asking a question of the type like, was this a probable initial condition, something like this. And indeed, a lot of cosmologists like to argue that way. But there is no way we can ever measure this probability. It's a completely metaphysical argument. It, it's, not, it's not proper science. Do I understand you in saying that you, you are actually having a, a, a strong position there of saying experiment just doesn't solve this? It, it doesn't solve it. I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. It has not solved it so far. Maybe it's possible it will solve it, but to do that, we first need a different theory. <laughs> So within the current theoretical framework, ultimately you can't solve the problem. You will always need to put in some initial condition and then you can ask, well, why this initial condition? And we can only shrug shoulders because we cannot ever explain this initial condition uh, within the context of the theories that we currently have. Yep. And so how do we decide between those theories if it's not something that can be determined by looking experimentally? What is your process for choosing between one theory and another? Oh, I'm, I'm not saying you can't decide between them experimentally. Certainly, if you had such a theory, it would also make different predictions. Maybe Lee can say something about that. 
Well, I can, and the theory that you mentioned, that you were kind enough to mention, for example, predicts that the largest stable neutron star should be no more than twice the mass of the sun. And that's a prediction which is very vulnerable at the time, at the present time. You, we do not typically in science test, theory, test theories against nothing. We test theories against other theories. And I would think from Tara's point of view, and you really said it, what you want us to do is make alternative theories which have some amount of plausibility, which make a prediction that's different than the current standard theories. And one of the things that Feyerabend emphasized is that a, a measurement or an observation that presently has no significance at all can come to be a crucial test of the new proposal against the old proposal. So the possible role of experiments is not static. It grows creatively as the theoretical challenges grow. And we're used to saying that to test a fundamental theory, a more fundamental theory beyond the standard model, we have to go to certain energies and TEVs and to test quantum gravity, we have to go to a certain energy and Planck units. But wait, somebody may invent a beyond the standard model theory that challenges experimentally the present theory in a wholly unexpected way. Before Galileo, nobody would have thought that dropping objects off a tower was a test of fundamental theory. And because Galileo invented an alternative to Aristotle, all of a sudden it became, uh, with the right interpretation, a test of fundamental theory. Tharabin certainly proposed a very different way of thinking about science from the, from, from the traditional one and drew attention to the... Uh, the extent to which the way we interpret the world with our supposed facts in experiments is a consequence of, uh, of the theory itself. But Farabin surely has the puzzle of how do we choose between the theories in the first place? You know, he sti he's still got that puzzle. And um, I mean, maybe Tara, you know, as the experimentalist here, you presumably want to uh, want to defend experiment from, from uh, being at sea amongst theory? Um, well, I, I never think experiment's at sea. I, I just think experiment has a limit. It's, it's inability to test all of the regions which would allow us to um, adequately test theory simply due to technological sort of complications and our inability to, to um, invent new materials, et cetera, sort of fast enough. To me, experiment is the ultimate arbiter to choose between different approaches in theory, because it is, it's, it's a fact. It, 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 it supplies a fact that has to be met by theory if that theory is gonna be correct. So that, that's the way as an experimentalist that, that I view this. And I'm really interested listening to the discussion about how this is a problem caused by different initial conditions and whether that the existence of different initial conditions is itself a problem or not. To me, I'm really at the other end of this problem and I can, I can appreciate very much what you're saying. But from my experimentalist point of view, I would really prefer to have this expressed in terms of predictions that I could then see whether um, they were correct or not. And, and, and I know this isn't possible, um, particularly in, in my regime of experiment, it needs different types of experiment. But to me, that is the way that we can move forward. It's not enough just to choose between theories, as you've said or to apply a principle to choose a theory or not, it has to match reality. This is why I don't think uh, working on the supposed baryon asymmetry or matter-antimatter problem is a good strategy. Um, the, you know, it, it can be solved in quite an easy way. There's no particular reason to develop a new theory. Um, but, uh, as Lee has already pointed out, there are serious problems uh, in the theories that do require 
an, an improved theory, like for example, the measurement problem, uh, quantum gravity, uh, or maybe one can also add uh, like dark matter, like there's something in need of, of explaining, which we currently can't explain. And um, so if you manage to develop a theory that solves one of those problems, uh, then hopefully that theory will also make uh, new predictions, which you can then go and test with, um, I don't know, some, some telescope mission or a particle collider or, you know, some, some, some other kind of thing. It's just that I think this, this baryon asymmetry uh, is, not, is not a particularly promising problem to solve because uh, there, there's no problem in need of a solution. Can we envisage a situation where we do have a complete theory of antimatter, or, or, or might we somehow reframe it uh, as something else, as you seem to be implying? What, what I'm interested in is what we mean by theory, not to have a... I love to have a philosophical argument, but for example, what I'm studying now is whether, and you're going to tell me I'm crazy, whether it would make sense to say that the laws of physics learn how to be the best laws as the universe evolves. Maybe much of this is before the Big Bang. And that sounds crazy, but let's note that we have these intelligent machines that we think can learn. And I, I, I'm staying far away from, are they anything like us? Are they conscious? I think we will admit that they can learn. And if I can code the instructions for one of these intelligent or learning machines in the laws of the standard model, then I can envision a situation where the standard model is what it is because it learns something about how to be a universe. And I know that's sounding provocatively crazy, but I think it's more, it, the, let me quote Feynman. If a whole lot of smart people have failed to solve a problem despite much, much effort, then maybe it's time to turn the problem on its head. And it might be that you discover it's an entirely different problem that does have a solution. And I do think that it is, Overall, the situation in fundamental physics is calling for very for new ideas and different ideas about what a theory is and how it relates to experiment. But I I think we have if we go there, then everything like this is at stake. Well, that's a very sort of profound suggestion, uh, Lee, and um, obviously to to see laws as something that might change and evolve uh, would be a radical uh, alternative to the way that we currently currently understand how science functions. A fascinating suggestion. Uh, Sabina, what, what, what's, what is your thought in response to that? You know, I, I, I'm going to say the thing that Leah has heard like one, one million times. Uh, if, if you have a law that changes, uh, then you have a different law that tells you how the law changed. So, so it's again a law. I'm only talking effective field theory. I'm not, I'm not actually saying anything profound. I'm an instrumentalist. Okay, if you give me a theory uh, and uh, I can calculate something with it and uh, it fits to observations, I would call that a good theory. And there, there other people like to tell stories about uh, what this mathematics means. Okay, it may be that the universe learns or the universe makes new universes and so on and so forth. And I would just say, well, that's a kind of an optimization problem. Okay, you can, you can always uh, look at it from that perspective. And, and that's that's uh, th that's fine with me, and and uh, I actually think that um, to move on in the foundations of physics, we we kind of need a theory like that. Maybe not exactly this, <laughs> but uh, so something in this direction. Uh, maybe uh, I. I um, so th there's kind of a related idea has been put forward by um, David Deutsch, um, who has this idea of constructor theory. Um, and I, I don't really feel uh, confident enough to to tell you exactly what this is about. Uh, but but basically, he's he's saying that um, this route that we've been on um, in particle physics and in cosmology that we're looking for explanations 
going to shorter and shorter distances and further and further back in time um, may have its limits. And he's trying to say that maybe some of those explanations uh, may actually be found on larger scales. And uh, one of the examples that, that he's given to me is that maybe um, the laws of nature um, are so that they have to be Turing computable. Okay, so he, he's a computer person. So, so that's the kind of problem he would come up with. And that puts some restrictions on how the laws of nature are. But it's not something that you would find by going to shorter and shorter scales or asking about the initial conditions of the universe. It's a kind of explanation that we don't currently think about in the foundations of physics. And I, I kind of feel that we need some entirely new thought thoughts of, of, of that order of magnitude to move on. Tara, where do you, you, uh, you stand here? Do you think we're going to have a complete theory of antimatter at some point, or, or do we need something radically new? Oh, I, I, I'm now feeling really optimistic after listening to, to, to Lee and Sabine, because but, well, first of all, um, I, I don't regard it as a complete theory of, of antimatter. It has to be a complete theory of matter plus forces. And, and then as an experimentalist, I get slightly um, depressed by this because we have this um, theory, the standard model, which despite everything we throw at it, just bounces back again. And, and we know it's, it's got to have limits. And we have been unable to find the limits and the breakdown and, and how we can move forward to something deeper. So. I would really, really love there to be a fundamental problem with the way that we're viewing the universe. I would really love there to be um, a fundamental shift needed in our in our viewpoint and our ability to describe it, and for that to be realised. I think that would be the most wonderful thing. That really would be progress. Well, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to have to wrap it up there. I think it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I'd like to thank the. Uh, the speakers, Sabina Hossenfelder, Tara Shears, and Lee Smolin for a properly fascinating debate at the very edge of where we currently stand, understand contemporary physics. Thank you. For more debates, talks, and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.